So if we look at this period, 1982 to 1985, right? We set it off with a little planet rock um, and using electronic musical instruments to make rap music. So move on from a band to using electronic you know, musical instruments. I mean, you know, people ask me, you know, do I like EDM? I say, fuck yeah, I like hip hop. This is electronic dance music made using electronic means, you know. Um, but if we look at this era, this three-year period from 1982 to 1985, what defines the music of this period? A lot of the stuff that we listen to, right, you know, comes from the, this period or a little bit later. When we'll define what happens after 85. Um, but this is how people made music, right? Interpolating, replaying you know, songs using a synthesizer. Oh, we like this melody, you know, this Kraftwerk melody, let's replay it, you know, shit like that. But you'd only replay a part. It was an early form of sampling. You, you, you would replay only a part. You would interpolate only, you know, a part of a, of a song, a riff, or whatever you like. Um, all the drums came from drum machines. No one had sampled drums or sampled at all at this point so no no drum sampling it was all coming from drum machines that you could that you could program and sequence in a drum machine uh you did have some live instrumentation uh, primarily guitar like people would play guitar whether it's a bass guitar electric guitar um etc like the, they would play you know stuff would get played in, in that way um you would also have djs who would cut music so um, we'll listen to Peter Piper. And Peter Piper takes this classic Bob James break, Take Me to Mardi Gras, which we'll learn more about today and in our next unit. Um, you know, and he's scratching that, and that's like the melody part. And then, you know, they, they have the drums and all that being programmed. Um, so DJ's cutting and punch phrasing, so it's part of the music. Um, and this is where you really start to see, like, the typical rap music structure come out from you know you didn't have this with like fucking you know any disco rap right because it was just like 400 bar verse <laughs> you know with no choruses and stuff but you start to see this this more typical thing where you have you know eight bar intro 16 bar verse eight bar or 16 bar chorus 16 bar verse you know blah 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 you know typical structure you see in rap songs but n know this no sampling no samples you know no samples yet so seminal in this time period when we talk about so many of these artists run dmc ll cool j beastie boys uh you know uh public enemy um you know all these artists, we got to talk about Rick Rubin and Russell Simmons, Uncle Russ. Um, you got to say it with a little lisp because he's got a little, a little lisp. But, uh, you, you know, just some bits about Rick Rubin. I mean, he's like, you know, you know, one of the greatest producers of all time, like record producers. He knows how to make a record, make it sound crazy and crack. And he's produced, you know, metal records, rap records, punk I think probably country, I mean, pretty much everything, you know. Um, but, you know, Rick Rubin is a little rich kid, you know, um, privileged, rich, only child. Um, you know, went to NYU, um, you know, which is largely, you know, uh, you know, where he really set up his recording studio. You know, he founded Def Jam when he was in high school still, um, primarily to release uh, records for his group called Hose, which is like a punk group that he was in. And, but his whole thing is, you know, or was, like, he wants to make art. Don't give a fuck about money. He just, like, wants to make art, okay? And when he started to, like, hear, uh, you know, hip-hop music and rapping and stuff, this is, like, in 82, 83, probably 83, you know, whatever. He's at NYU. You know, he's, like, he's, like, loved it. And he also thought, you know, he really thought of it as black punk music, that it had the, so many of the same aesthetics, like not sonically, but the culture, right? It was like, a, you know, punk music was reacting to mainstream 
culture, you know, and dominant society and and it was young young people and they were developing their own style and voice and identity. All these things we talked about. Hey bud. Hey Spanx. Say hi. Um, anyways. And his whole signature was like this incredibly stripped down, bare, you know, sort of naked, um, you know, raw, cracking, super fucking loud street sound was what he was what he was into. Okay, and then we have uh, Russell Simmons, and they met in like '84, I think. Um, and uh, you know, Rick had actually put out a record with. Uh, you know, he teamed up with Jazzy J from Zulu Nation. He put out a record with T La Rock called It's Yours on Def Jam in like maybe 83. And, you know, Russell had heard that record. Uh, and at the time, Rus Russell was a, a, you know, was a club promoter and manager. And he uh, managed Curtis Blow. Uh, Russ, uh, you know, managed Run DMC and that includes his brother, Rev Run. He was very business minded, you know, and this became part of their duality was one was Rick was about the art and Russ was like about making that money you know and that's where they also conflicted as, as well and you know the way that you know Russell this 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 was a compliment to Rick's ideas like hip-hop as black punk was Russell actually he didn't see it hip-hop as black music per se he saw it as teen music as young people music so he thought it would appeal to white, white young people, audiences, which at the time, it hadn't gotten there really yet. Like it was still, you know, largely consumed by blacks, you know, and that was just what, what, it, what, what it was at, at the time. And they were seminal in like basically crossing over rap into the mainstream through Run DMC and through the Beastie Boys. So Russ came on after the label was founded and, you know, helped, helped blow it up. And then he had, you know, Rush Management where he managed all these artists. And you can watch a movie called Crush Groove, which is kind of like a, um, a movie about Def Jam. It's a, like a fake biopic about Def Jam, but it's not really a biopic. Hey, bud. Um, anyways. Uh, so... Before we get into more music, I got to mention one of the most important producers of this era. Um, and like he's in my top 10 all time. His name is Larry Smith or Larry Lair. Um, he coined this sound. Uh, what he called the crush groove, you know, which is the name of the movie. But his sound was the crush groove and it was his style and sound of music that he made. And it was basically... He used the, um, the DMX, the Oberheim DMX drum machine. He didn't use the 808. Um, and he, you know, um, loved, like, again, the stripped down sort of sound, this raw sound with, you know, hand clap sound that the, the DMX had. Um, you know, he loved DJ scratches, and he would sometimes include guitar and other melodies. Um, you hear him shout it out. You know, Larry, Larry, Larry stripped the sound down to the bone. You know, um, you know, Run DMC shot him out all the time. He's kind of like one of those people, you know, that never gets probably the the due respect that they get in terms of like the sound they help really define. But you know, he produced mo you know a ton of the early Run DMC um, records and albums and uh, and other Def Jam projects. Um, real important person.